afternoon, everybody. Welcome to another round of Health for the World round round today. So we'll just have like five more minutes for people to join and then we can start. Hello everyone. So I'll be introducing today's speaker. 
I have the privilege of introducing Gregory Marcus. He's a consultant in endovascular therapy and interventional radiology at Guy's and St. Thomas Hospitals in London. He's also a fellow of the Royal College of Radiology. He's also the past chairman of the European Forum for Interventional Radiology Trainees in and VSR training committee. It's okay. I have a lot of Sorry about that. So introducing Gregory Marcus, he's also the past chairman of the European Forum for Interventional Radiology Trainees, ETF in Syracuse, and also the media past chairman of BSIR Training Committee. Greg's main interests include vascular and women's health, IR education, and raising awareness around the role of IR mm -hmm. in global health. He's also passionate about research and is an author of many peer-reviewed publications and book chapters. Welcome Gregory Marquis for his presentation today. I, I thought you were supposed to keep it short. <laughs> so thanks for uh, thanks for the pre nice presentation, Ponzi. Uh, you're sitting next to me so I can hear myself twice. Okay. Oh, do you want to, maybe you want to put the sound? No, 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 it's good. I need to take the volume take the volume down of the computer. Okay. So, so yeah, my name is Gregory. Uh, I. Sorry. Sorry. So just... Okay. So, so yeah, so today we're going to talk about re revascularization techniques in, uh, in, arterial, in arterial atherosclerotic disease. Um, so uh, as you know, it's a very, arterial disease is very, very common uh, in the Western world. But what we have realized in the last few years is that peripheral DS disease is becoming uh, increasingly prevalent in in the in you know Africa and Asia and South America, and mostly because people are getting older, people are changing their dietary habits, and they smoke more, and uh, generally they they tend to follow the unhealthy lifestyles of the Western. Uh, cultures so it's it's likely that um, for you guys who are training now in interventional rheology it's likely that you will have to work with your vascular surgeon vascular surgical colleagues and your cardiology colleagues uh, to treat people with um, arterial disease in their in their lower in their lower extremities um so today I, i'm not going to i'm not going to talk about um you can all go and, and read about peripheral DS disease and the virus classification systems and um we're not going to talk so much about standard techniques like ballooning and stenting of uh, atherosclerotic disease but we're mostly going to talk about um techniques for recanalization 
uh, outside the typical stenting and ballooning. In other words, as you know, ballooning and stenting are the mainstays of um, of treatment of atherosclerotic disease, either that's just a simple stenosis or an occlusion. But the main limitations of ballooning and stenting is that you can have recoiling after ballooning, or you can have restenosis or occlusion after after stenting. And generally speaking, the more metal work you leave within an artery, the more likely you are to have this kind of problems with restenosis and occlusion. And of course, fractures are, are common when you put stents in bending positions, uh, such as the popliteal segment or the common femoral artery segment, which is traditionally an area that you, you don't want to stand, but sometimes you have to if there's no alternative option or if it's a very old patient who doesn't move much. Um, but as you can see in this example, because of the change in hemodynamics that usually stents cause, you can have uh, increased, um, there's an increased risk for vessel inflammation and reocclusion of the stent. And as you can imagine, this can be a disaster if we're talking about a patient with critical limb ischemia who has already very limited reserves in terms of uh, collateral flow to the, to the distal foot. There are many papers that have been published showing how a stent can change the, the flow dynamics within the vessel and how this, uh, this dynamics can change and can actually cause a, a problem with the with stand with the state of agency. But I'm not going to spend too much time with this. I mean, you can always you can always go in the literature and, and, and read about this stuff. Um, but the bottom line is that when you're inserting uh, a metal stand, even if this is properly sized, it will change the yeah, well, the, just because I can hear myself twice annoying. Um, you, when you put a stent, then you're changing the dynamics within the the arterial environment, and that this can has uh, can has an effect. So sometimes you cannot avoid this. Sometimes you you have to take that risk, and you have to make sure that you size the stent properly, so you cause the minimal disruption in the flow dynamics of the vessel. Um, but sometimes you can you have to try and avoid this. So that's why there have been um, there has been the development of the last few years. There's more and more people are talking about this. Um, the leave nothing behind motion and the plaque modification idea. That instead of trying to cover a plaque with a stand, or instead of trying to keep a vessel open with a stand, we try to modify the plaque trying to leave as less metal as we can inside the vessel. And I'm, I'm, I'm sure you must have heard about, um, you know, virus technologies that have developed over the years, trying to accommodate these kind of ideas that they leave nothing behind the plaque modification motion. And um, of course, stenting, as effective as it can be, it has, it has a few limitations that you have to have in mind. Like, uh, so for example, when you have heavily calcified lesions, it's um, balloons, simple plain balloons cannot be effective. Drug eluding balloons will, can, will not probably be effective to, to break the plaque. And of course, if you try to stand a very calcified lesion, it's likely that your stand is not gonna open and you might end up with more problems than what you started with. Uh, limited drug effect in severe calcification, it's a well-known problem, so there's no point using all these expensive drug eluding balloons when there is a lot of calcium because, simple enough, the drug is not going to reach its target. Um, there are many there are some locations where you don't want to stand, especially the popliteal segment, and the, it's a very common place for, for disease, for atherosclerotic disease there. So we, there are special stents that we can use. 
that we can use in those areas that have specific properties uh, like the supera stand or previously you know we had the tigris stand from cook tigris not being used anymore um, so really we are only left with uh, a couple of options when it comes to stenting in the popliteal segment and that's because as you know the knee bends a lot when people are sitting or when they are trying to walk so if you put a normal a normal stand the regular stand then it's likely to fracture and, um, and and cause a significant you know complication disruption to the flow to to the foot so using a, a, a supera for example is is one option but what we are increasingly trying to do is we try to use alternative alternative techniques to just try to open the vessel without using without using a stent um, then when we have long lesions um, very often we have to do what's called a full metal jacket so if you have a long sfa occlusion sometimes you have to stand all the way from the um, from the sfa all the way down to the popliteal and again that's a lot of metal and very often we see these patients coming back with uh, with occlusions uh, and as a result then we have to thrombolize them or we have to reline the stand so we have to do a number of re-interventions in order to keep these uh, these stands open and of course they have to have be on anticoagulation um for, for a long time increasing complications like bleeding like brain bleeding or gi bleeding now the benefits of uh, so we're going to start with talking about atherectomy is one of these techniques that were developed to modify uh, to modify the plaque, and basically with atherectomy what you're trying to do is you're trying to create a, um, uh, you can try to recanalize heavily calcified vessels even when you have long occlusions. And uh, it's very useful when we are talking about disease in those uh, areas that we mentioned, the bending points like the popliteal or the comoral femoral artery. And it's effective in, uh, it's also effective when we're talking about instant stenosis. So let's say you have a, a stent that has been occluded, as uh, a chronic occlusion there, then you can use atherectomy to regain some lumen to. Um, improve flow to the foot. And of course, it can also be used for vessel preparation before you use a drug, uh, drug alone balloon. So, you know, as you, as you can see, there are many technologies that can be combined nicely, but it's very important to select the right patient for that and select the right, the right device and the right combination of technologies for, uh, for some of them. So, you know, I mean, 20 years ago, we had very, few, the problem was that we had very few options when it was coming to long SFA occlusions or uh, occlusions at bending points or occlusions below the knee. Now we have the other, the, the opposite problem. We have too many technologies and uh, for every patient, we have to decide what, what, what's the best technology to get the best result without um, wasting a ton of money and uh, minimizing the complications. So the most, um, starting with contraindication, so the main thing that you have to remember when we're talking about atherectomy is that you have to make sure that you cross the lesion sub, uh, luminally. And, and uh, here comes the distinction between a luminal um, passage and a subintimal passage. So a subintimal passage is basically when you dig a tunnel under the occlusion you go into the subintimal place of your wire and then you try to come on out on the other side and come back into the into the true lumen um and and sometimes this can be difficult hello sometimes this can be difficult sometimes it can be almost impossible to stay luminally okay uh, and in those occasions if you cannot really make sure that you are 100 percent luminally in your crossing then you can really use a thorectomy so i guess that's the main um problem that limits the use of atherectomy. And of course, the other, the other issue with atherectomy is that um, it's very easy to cause distal embolization. So let's, for example, let's say you have a 10 centimeter SFA occlusion and you decide to use atherectomy and you cross luminally and all goes well, and you use your atherectomy device, which is basically a drilling 
uh, it's a drilling catheter that goes up and down the occlusion, creating a tunnel. If you're not careful, some of that debris that's created during the atherectomy can trash the the distal circulation. So you can so you can start with um, you can start trying to sort one problem, and you might end up having created a, a bigger problem for yourself. So that's why, as I say, you know these kind of techniques are good and they work for certain people, but you have to be very careful. Um, uh, on how you're using them and uh, making sure that you select the right people. And of course, you have to always consent these people for uh, for these kind of complications, for the fact that you can actually make the circulation worse if there is a distal embolization. Um, I, I won't use atherectomy devices for uh, acute or subacute occlusions. We, we have we have other technologies for that. We have a thrombectomy. We have a thrombectomy devices like the angiojet, thrombolysis catheters. Personally, uh, in our institution, in uh, in St. Thomas Hospital, we use mostly angiojet for um, thrombectomy for acute or subacute thrombectomies. Now. There are various, as I was saying before uh, earlier, there are multiple different devices to choose from. Okay, this is just a, this is a table that shows all the different types of atherectomy. You have directional atherectomy, rotational, orbital, a laser atherectomy. In the UK, where it is where my experience coming from, um, we mostly in my hospital we use mostly rotational with. Uh, rotational atherectomy with a phoenix and jet stream. In the US, they use quite a lot of directional as well as um, some orbital. Um, starting with directional atherectomy, um, you know, as the, as the name suggests, you have all these, um, you use cutting blades with cutting blades on the one side of the catheter, which you have to point basically towards the side of the plaque to, to cut properly. And then there is a reservoir within the catheter to, to store and to absorb this, uh, um, the, the savings from, from the plaque, basically. Um, devices like this are the, you know, Silverhawk, Tuberhawk, all these fancy names. They used to like hawks in the, in the this seems to like, they like hawks a lot in the US. Um, it's a uh, directional atherectomy. I don't have much experience, but from the literature, it seems like. Uh, sorry, can you can you mute yourselves? Thanks. Can you hear me? Unmute. Okay, sorry about that. So directional atherectomy is one type. Then you have. Um, Then you have rotational atherectomy, where basically you, you have a catheter with uh, front cutting blades to, to debulk calcium. And um, for these devices, so some of these devices are, as I mentioned, the Jetstream or the Phoenix. So for the Phoenix, you have to use uh, a protection device, uh, which is a, basically a filter. And the filter is like a basket, okay? All these, all these atherectomy devices obviously go over a wire. So basically, you, you have to cross the lesion luminally, as I mentioned earlier, okay? And then you have to uh, exchange that wire with, um, with a specific wire that has a filter at the end, which the filter is like a basket. And over that specific wire, which is, which is usually an 014 wire, you have to uh, through that over that wire you pass your atherectomy device. And um, these atherectomy devices, uh, for example, the Phoenix comes as a um, is a it has a battery at the at the handle of the of the device, so it's it's quite easy to use. Um, for the Phoenix one, you don't really need an atherectomy. You don't really need a filter filter protection because the device itself it uses a, a special mechanism that absorbs the, um, the the shavings from the from the plaque. So in theory, you don't need the uh, filter protection. Um, 
with the Phoenix, which is the device that probably has had most of my experience with, um, it's, as I said, quite easy to use. You can use the device for, for a while. Uh, obviously, they are single use devices and they can be quite expensive. They're like a thousand, a thousand pounds to fifteen hundred pounds uh, per device. Um, and what you do is you start from the top of the lesion and you after you 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 dig that tunnel you dig that tunnel going going towards the the end of the lesion and uh, there are some various techniques that people use to make sure that there is not much trust or that you minimize the risks of trussing which is which are things like uh, leaving a distal cup so when you getting closer to reach the, the the end of the occlusion some people it just stop just before that end they they do a, they, they do a few more passages up and down to increase the lumen within the lesion and then uh, they proceed to do to do the cup very very carefully so that's the most one of the most common ways that you can minimize the, the risk of trashing you know, uh, with a phoenix or, or a jet stream. The jet stream is, is slightly different. Um, jet stream, as I said, you need to use uh, a protection device. And uh, because these wires are obviously 014, you don't have so much support. So sometimes before you use your um, so sometimes it might be very hard to push through that lesion because obviously these catheters are a bit bulkier than a simple four friends catheter uh, so sometimes you might have to do a little bit of pre-dilating with a small balloon a two millimeter balloon maybe um, to just allow for the for the catheter to to pass through but definitely sometimes especially in long lesion it might be it might be uh, challenging to push this direct to this uh, arthrectomy devices through the lesion orbital devices uh, i don't have much experience with them uh, it's di the diamond back is um, is one it's a commonly used one and they use a diamond as you can see a diamond coated crown um, that basically rotates in high speed and and um, uh destroys destroys the plaque pretty much as you can imagine again for these ones you can create a lot of debris that can go down with the flow so you need uh, you need to produce protection device and this is what the protection device looks like this is the filter um as you you, you can see here for example there's a long segment occlusion in, uh, in in picture in uh, diagram A, then uh, we have cro we're crossing the lesion and we put the filter distally to the lesion and then we start we do the atherectomy, and as you can see sometimes in picture D, you can see that the, you know the the debris that can end up in in the basket, and obviously if we didn't have that basket in there, um, all this debris would go all the way down to the to the distal circulation to the foot causing causing trouble and these are some of the these are the some of the combinations so you can see in one in, in one column you have the devices and on the other column you have the guide wires and diesel protection devices that are recommended and as as i mentioned you can see that most of them are Oh, one four wires, with the only exception, which is the Rotar X, which is quite quite old device to be honest with you. Not many people use it anymore. Um, and the Rotar X can use an 018, 018 system. The Rotar X is also like uh, is is, uh, is also like a drill, and it actually sounds like a drill, um, and it's, it creates a tile in in the vessel again for the rotrex you don't really need a filtering device because as the as the as the drill uh as the as the drill rotates the pieces of the plaque that cuts off they are being absorbed by the by the catheter again you can see a picture of how this or this some of the most common uh, filter devices look like uh, the spider fx and the nav6 from uh, from abbott uh, basically there are baskets okay and you deliver them through a catheter and when you're done you just uh, resheath them 
in a catheter and, and that's how you you collect all that debris into the catheter and removing that from the circulation now now what's the evidence um in a very recent cochrane review published in 2020 uh, it was it was shown that the evidence is actually it's there's actually not much there's not a lot of was wrong sorry so uh, as you can see there's not much um, there wasn't good quality data to suggest that atherectomy is uh, actually better than simple um, ballooning and, and stenting there was the date the, from the pooling of the data that they performed, they couldn't see evidence to suggest that. However, um, the, the authors suggested that they cannot really be sure about that because of the poor quality data. The reality is that it always depends, it always has to do with, um, with patient selection, okay? And always has to do with, um, uh, operator's experience and it has it's a it's a very operator dependent heavy procedure in my opinion i've seen people using this um without having to use this many times and i've seen people who are experts and have been doing this every uh, a long time and the, the difference it's uh it's enormous okay so especially for these technologies where they you know uh, a they cost a lot of money and b they can cause significant complications. We have to be very, very careful when it comes to patient selection. And when we're doing our first cases, we should always get some proctoring from someone who is more senior and uh, has done this many times. Um, because if you're not careful, for example, a very common problem with this um, with this atherectomy devices is that they can get stuck on the catheter so you might not be able to to pull them out and they might, they might get stuck on your wire uh, and you might lose position you might have to bring everything out so there, there are many things that you know you need to get familiar with before you start doing these techniques um, but yeah if they are used from you know in the right setting from people with experience then uh, they, they can work pretty well okay now the, the other an, another uh, relatively new technology that can be used for uh, one type of lesions that can be especially tricky uh, is lithotripsy balloons. And uh, these lithotripsy balloons are especially useful when we're talking about dealing with uh, severely calcified lesions. And we, we see more and more people with chronic calcified lesions. And uh, recent, recent studies have shown that the rate and the degree of dissection following a balloon angioplasty is higher than, than we thought. And that's, this is not a surprise, okay? Because when you are doing an angioplasty, you're basically stretching the wall of the artery. So, if you're not using the right size of balloon or if you're not using the light the right length of balloon then uh, then you can cause dissections and you can actually cause a lot of trouble vascular calcifications restrict vascular expansion and it can actually increase complications that can actually increase the rate of uh, of dissections so that's why you have to be you have to be very careful and of course sometimes uh, calcifications don't just don't uh, respond to to a simple angioplasty, or they cause your balloon to, to rupture. And as we mentioned earlier, even stenting sometimes might not, might not work. You might try to stand a very calcified lesion just to realize that your, open, your stent doesn't open and um, you spend a few hundred pounds without getting a good result. Now, the, the whole purpose of this intravascular, uh, litho the, the concept of intra of lithotripsy came from uh, from urology, where they use uh, this kind of lithotripsy technology to break uh, stones in the in the in the kidney, and um, these catheters were developed to try and recreate this um, in the arterial system. 
basically the way that these uh, balloons work is that again you have to cross the the lesion i mean on for the for lithotopsy balloons it doesn't really matter if you are sub, if, if there is a little subintimal plane but you should try and be as um as luminal as you can for most for the majority of the of the length of the lesion so you have to deliver the lithotripsy catheter across the calcified lesion, and this is uh, this usually takes place over an 014 wire. Again, a very flimsy wire, so you have to be careful. Um, and you in the, and and the balloon then is expanded to um, to to a very low uh, very low pressure. Usually, it's we start with three four atmospheres. And basically, what you're trying to do with this balloon, this balloon is doesn't doesn't you're not using this balloon to uh, distend the vessel. You're just using this balloon to create some. Um, uh, you you want to create good opposition between the balloon and the wall. So you're not trying to stretch the vessel, if that makes sense. Okay, you just try to create some. Uh, um, so you, you have good contact between the balloon and the and the plaque. So and the reason for that is because you want to use this space between the catheter and and the and the and the plaque. You want to use this space to deliver the energy from the catheter. So basically, what happens is that there is an electrical discharge from the emitters that vaporizes fluid within the balloon, creating an expanding and collapsing bubble, okay, that which generates a sonic pressure wave. And this wave creates a localized field effect that travels through the through the tissues, through the through the calcified plaque and causes micro cracks within within the plaque. So when you cause cracks within the plaque that means that um, the plaque becomes weaker and you can then use a conventional balloon to 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 open it up um, and here's a nice example so you you can see here an almost complete occlusion of the of the of the sfa this is a lithotripsy balloon a shockwave balloon as the uh, as its commercial name and again the balloon is just inflated to be it's a compliant balloon, so it's it, it's inflated just to have good opposition with the wall. Okay, we're not trying to stress the vessel. And after we initiate the, the lithotripsy, you can see how nicely the, the, the vessel, the, the, I mean, obviously you cannot see that here, but if we had a video of the of the of the balloon as it's doing its the lithotripsy you would you would slowly see the balloon expanding as the as the shock waves are delivered into the plaque and that's because because of the cracking of the plaque sl slowly but steadily the plaque um, cracks and allows more space for the balloon to to expand okay there have been a couple of studies they have a few studies on this, like the, the disrupt uh, pad and the disrupt P, uh, BTK studies that they have showed uh, um, promising results. And um, the most important thing is that, as you can see here, the dissection rate was 1.7% uh, in the PAD, in the above knee, and 4.8 in the below knee study. And the bailout standing was also quite low in the above knee, 1.7. Um, that's the, the above knee study, and 9.5 in the below knee study. These are good numbers. Again, uh, these, these were small, relatively small studies. And again, it, it's always it's always about um, call, um, selecting the right patients, okay, and making sure that you're using these balloons uh, appropriately because they are also quite expensive. They're also around one thousand um, pounds per balloon. Now the Spe uh, specially designed dissection stents is uh, is a quite new thing. I think they were. Uh, first few publications came out a couple of years ago and basically these are tiny stents that their their main focus is to 
make sure that if you have a little dissection from the from your ballooning somewhere that you deploy this this small stand just at the entrance of this dissection so you basically close the flap from its beginning without the need to deploy uh, a four or five or six centimeter long stand so you minimize the amount of metal that you leave in in the vessel without covering too much healthy uh, tissue uh, you can see here uh, in the post pta angiogram you can see the um, there's a proximal and a distal dissection and you can see how it looks on um, on the on the angiogram and then uh, on the intravascular ultrasound uh, i don't know if you if uh, any of you have seen intravascular basically intravascular ultrasound is a, a catheter that has an ultrasound probe at, at its tip okay and uh, you can put that catheter over a wire into the artery and uh, you can see here that this that's the catheter in the middle you can see that's the lumen and that's the wall of the vessel and this is a dissection flap and you you know that this is dissection flap because you have flow here and because you have flow on the you have a pseudo lumen on the on the outside so sometimes intervascular ultrasound can be very useful again we use this a lot in uh, in our in our center to for 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 a few reasons so we use it for example to um, assess the, what's the true diameter of the vessel to see if we are having for creating dissections and of course we're, we're using it a lot to make sure that um, we have crossed luminally um, uh, a total occlusion of, uh, of an artery <clears throat> The name of this um, endovascular system is called TAC, um, and as you can, and it looks a bit like this. So you you can see here that was probably the beginning of the dissection somewhere here, and uh, you can see that you can develop you can deliver two, three, or more smaller uncovered stents to just to just seal off that. Um, dissection without having to stand the entire lesion. Again, this is a technology that uh, I haven't used personally, uh, and I, I don't, I don't think it has come to. I don't, I'm not sure if it has come to Europe yet or not. Uh, but I, 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 I've heard that people have been using this in the US. And uh, again, there is uh, there is some evidence. Um, still quite limited there's uh, there's still a lot of research that will um, um will have to take place before we can know for sure if this is a successful strategy or not because again this technology is associated with significant cost but of course as I, as I, as i have uh, as I've, as i keep saying the first thing that you need to do is to to cross the lesion okay and especially when you have tight chronic uh, uh, calcified lesions this can be extremely difficult and um, while 10 years ago we had like two different types of wires maybe three um, nowadays we have many different many different options and that that is very important to to find to have at least three or different three four three two or three different types of crossing wires uh, in, in your position before you start doing complex atherosclerotic work um, simply because you need these wires to to maximize your effectiveness when it comes when it comes to treating those lesions and um, these wires are very important because they can help you cross a lesion luminally. It doesn't matter how good you are. If you're trying with a teruma to cross a lesion, the teruma is most likely that's going to is going to create the subintimal plane because its job it's not to to cross luminally very very atherosclerotic very calcified plaques. That's why, in my opinion, I mean, in our institution, we have at least um, a, a command 018 wire and a command 014 wire. And um, if if these catheters don't work, then uh, we move to an Asahi type of catheter like the Gladius, um, which is our final um, it's a final wire that we're going to try uh, in in a very um, 
stubborn lesion if we cannot cross with any any of the other uh, wires. So usually we're going to start with the Terumo. We're not going to spend too much time with the Terumo. We're going to continue with the command O and eight to cross the lesion luminally. Then we might try with the command O and four, and then uh, if we really want to persist, and if, if everything else has failed, then we might go with a uh, with an Asahi wire. The difference of these um, all these catheters comes it has to do with their with their tips. As you can see, the tips are designed differently, and they can have different loads, and they 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 have a different they have different properties. And most of these wires, especially the Asahi wires, they have their, their tip can be is very is usually very sharp, and you have to use this Asahi wire as as you're using this basically as a drill. So you you use its tip to drill a very tiny hole through the atherosclerosis um, until you reach the, the other side. And that's why you have to be very careful with these wires because if you're not careful, you can, you can very easily um, uh, uh, go outside the vessel. We're not gonna talk now about the various types of stenting in uh, below in lesions. Anyway, so that's the first part of the of the presentation. I don't know how much time we have. Um, so yeah, so there are many new devices that we use to debulk and modify the plaque. Okay, there's this new motion of trying to leave nothing behind, which ideally is uh, you know what we should be trying to achieve. Okay, trying to remove this atherosclerosis from the vessel. However, again. This is not always possible, and sometimes it's easy. It's easier to say that uh, than to actually than actually doing it. They are time-consuming procedures. Okay, they're expensive procedures. Um, the kit is very expensive, and all these procedures. When we when we know that we're going to perform an atherectomy, we have to put aside at least three four hours of the day just for this case. Okay, so we have spent six seven hours working on on cases like this where you use, where you use a thorectomy uh, trying to and and as i said most of these times these are um, for people with uh, critical limb ischemia okay people who are about to lose a limb and just and just so i give you an idea why i mean some of you might think okay why it makes sense to spend all this money um, to save a leg from someone so there have been there has been there has there have been studies in the UK that show that someone who had an above knee um, uh, amputation will cost the the healthcare system thirty thousand pounds per year just for uh, uh, for his healthcare needs every year thirty thousand pounds. So every year you can delay the amputation because very often this is what you're trying to do. You're just trying to delay the, the amputation one year and one more year because usually these people are quite old. They, they have many other comorbidities and you have to remember that a patient with who has a uh, has critical limb ischemia is very likely to, to die from uh, from uh, from a myocardial infarction from a stroke. This, this is a disease that doesn't only affect the leg, it affects the entire vasculature and affects the vasculature of the heart. It's likely that these people will have atherosclerosis disease in their heart, atherosclerosis disease in their stroke, in their, in their heads, in their brains. So these people are usually very sick, okay? So usually by the time they, have, they develop CLI, the the prognosis, the five-year prognosis is not, is not great anyway. So if, even if you can improve their lives for one, two, three years and prevent an amputation, that's, that's still pretty good for them, okay? And um, yeah, I mean, for all these devices, of course, we have to say that the, the clinical data is still limited, okay? And that's why it's a it's a, it's a case by case selection. So we we when we decide to use case to, to use this kind of technologies, we have we usually have to pass this through our our, our multidisciplinary meet and make sure that everybody agrees that okay we we can spend this kind of money and this kind of time for this patient and this makes sense. Um, and obviously. The management approach, because of all these different technologies that we have, 
um, the management approach can be very different, okay? And you can see many different combinations depending on which center. You, we can be here, we can be here all day um, talking about this. But the main the main thing is that you know when it comes to treating critical ischemia, you need to do this as early as possible. Okay, time is time is money. The more the more blood flow you can save into the leg, the more tissue you can save, and the more functional the patient can remain after this. Okay, the worst case scenario is you know having you know early amputations, having people who cannot. And of course, after an amputation, I mean, you should all know that after in people who have like a uh, below knee, even below knee amputations, their prognosis uh, drops significantly. So most of them, I think it's 25 or 30 percent of them, um, you know, they, they, they're going to their five year prognosis is, is not great. To, I'm, I'm not I'm not sure about the exact statistic at the moment, um, but yeah, the moment they have an amputation, the, the risk of dying goes up significantly so that's why we're trying really hard to to prevent that from happening okay um yeah i don't think i have time for the rest i think we uh, yeah do are there any questions on these um on these technologies So there's someone. So there's someone is asking if during a uh, intravascular lithotripsy do I use protection? No, during the intravascular lithotripsy we don't usually use um, uh, filter devices. If this is what you mean. I mean, for all these cases, as I said, I mean, especially when you have complicated below knee disease or um, long lesions in the SFA, long occlusive lesions in the SFA, um, or combination of a long occlusive disease in the SFA with below knee disease, all these procedure, all these patients are usually uh, quite. These are quite complex cases. And it's good to have um, a good collaboration with your vascular surgeons because um, and as 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 you know, as sexy as endovascular is, it is. Then um, sometimes you, ha you you might have to consider: is there are there any endovascular? Are there any open options? So, for example, bypass remains a very good option for for younger people with um, PAD. Okay, and it's probably more. It's probably a, a very very durable option for the younger people now if we're talking about the older people who don't have veins or they're not fit for surgery then obviously endovascular becomes the, the main option okay but it's important to have a, an open line of communication with your with your vascular surgical colleagues so you are all on the same page and that's why it's important to have a multidisciplinary meeting where you have your uh, where you have cardiology so where you have vascular surgeons and cardiology and, and interventionalists and podiatrists okay podiatrists are also very important they are actually extremely important when it comes to reducing uh, amputation rates and uh, uh, improving the quality of life of these patients so you know it's very easy to you know put and put a needle in an artery and uh, deploy a balloon in an artery and you know everybody can deploy a stent the main thing is to is this the right thing for this patient am i doing something that is gonna is gonna compromise him later on okay because very often we see people just deploying stents whenever whatever without thinking that okay this stent the angiographic picture might look nice now okay but what's going to happen in six months from now because the moment that stand graft goes down, the, the moment that stand goes down, then um, you know that's one step closer to to amputation. Okay, so that's why we need to, you know, we need to have an agreed pathway of uh, of how we approach these lesions. Okay, and of course in your practice. 
uh, I mean, I know that you are all, uh, you know, interventional radiologists just starting now in uh, in uh, in Africa, and that vascular disease is not the most common thing. But as people get older, and as as I was saying, as people, um, you know, ad 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 adopt most we more Western sort of lifestyles, uh, atherosclerotic disease is going to be more prevalent, and you're going to see more of that in your uh, in your in your lives and in your careers. So yeah, so keep start, keep reading about these things. Try to take every opportunity to, you know, practice with these patients, uh, engage with your vascular colleagues. Um, it's good. I it's good to have them on board. Okay, they have a different set of skills that we don't have. Um, and um, yeah, and try to to be. Uh, realistic about your expectations the expectations you create to to the patient and um and uh, obviously you know we I'm, I'm always happy to discuss cases and um you know you have our you have my email so please feel free to to contact me okay thank you very much okay, i'll stop now stop sharing here So don't be shy. Uh, if, if you have any questions, even if it's something irrelevant to today's presentation, um, you can always ask. Good morning, doctor. Hello. Good morning. Hello. Hey, good morning, Doctor. It's a very great honor to be on your side. I am speaking from Peru, especially from a province called Quincayo. Thank you so much for the lesson and setting us in. From where? Sorry? Different. From Peru, from Peru, from South America. Ah, oh, okay, great. Uh, Hello. Hey, thank you so much uh, for the lessons and setting us into this fascinating world. I was talking with that intention. Can you of, speak a bit louder? Because I can't, I can't hear you. Yeah, I um, yeah, thank you so much for the lessons and accepting us into this fascinating world. My pleasure. Do you do any vascular work there in Peru? Yeah, we are uh, we are trying to enter to this world. We are uh, doing basic uh, endovascular procedures, but we are with all the intention of develop all the knowledge uh, because we are uh, a country that is growing up, uh, we are developing other techniques and also we are trying to reach the technology. Okay. And is it mostly vascular surgeons who do this, uh, who work on these patients? Is it mostly uh, you? Who, who is mostly responsible for endovascular work in Peru? Here in Peru are the, uh, the surgeries, the cardiovascular surgeries, but also in interventional radiology, we are doing the intention to develop this knowledge and these techniques. Okay, okay, the same. Thank you, thanks for sharing. Thank you so much, thank you so much. Any, any questions for the, the people in this room? Mm -hmm. So Fonzi, who sits next to me, asked if the place of empirical anticoagulation for these patients to minimize their risk. They still during what do you what do you mean, Fonzi? Yeah. Yeah. So it, it depends how, how bad the, the, the trussing is. So what we usually do, them, I mean, the moment we realize that we have trussed the leg. So, I mean, obviously during these procedures, I mean, these are long procedures, okay? Um, so as I said, you, they can take three, four hours sometimes. So you have to make sure that you heparinize the patient properly. So during the procedure, uh, you know, when we, are, when we are about to start with um, a thyrectomy or the ballooning or whatever we're about to start doing, or when wherever we're, we're about ready to start crossing, we're going to give, um, we're going to do an ACT. And so basically we measure 
um, uh, you know, the, how to put it now, the coagulation of ability of the patient, how, how um, coagulable the blood is. So if it's less than 200, so basically we measure in real time the coagulation effect of heparin. Okay, so we start before we give the heparin and then after we give the heparin. So you should make sure that your heparin, your, uh, your co the coagulation level of the patient is stays above a certain degree, okay? Um, so for example, most people start with 5,000, okay? And they give 5,000 and then they, they might be going on for three, four hours. And uh, obviously, that means that after a while, the the patient becomes the, the blood becomes thinner and th sorry becomes thicker and thicker and thicker again. So that's why it's important to keep an eye on your heparinization. So very often in those procedures, we might have to do up to eight nine thousand units of heparin or ten thousand units of heparin sometimes. Um, so that's the first step to make sure that, this, that you don't get. Uh, that you like your your below your distal circulation doesn't thrombose, um, but when we, it comes to to trussing, and uh, or other, in other words, uh, when it comes to embolization, distal embolization, then when you realize that this has happened, then we are always going to give a little bit of uh, we're going to give some TPA, five thousand units of uh, alteplase, to to break the clot, along with some. Um, some nitrates to make sure there's no uh, spasm there. Sometimes we might try and go down with uh, with a catheter and try and aspirate with a small catheter, with a full French catheter and try to aspirate as much clot as we can. Um, and usually, um, if, if you do all these things along with, um, you know, some balloon, some angioplasting of the distal vessels, uh, after the alteplase and after the suction, then usually you you can you can restore flow. Okay, but it's very important to to make sure that you you realize that early, that you find out early about that. And uh, of course, the after the the after the procedure, when you have realized that when there is um, um, uh, distal embolization, then we might keep the, the we might heparinize the patient overnight. Okay, to make sure that we break any any residual thrombus uh, in the distal arteries. Uh, now, in terms of anticoagulation after the procedure in someone who had a, a stent placement, so traditionally for uh, early extending, uh, you don't really need to give anticoagulation unless there is another reason. For stents be below the inguinal ligament, and especially for stents under the, the knee, under the, the knee joint, um, it would, you have to give uh, a loading dose of, uh, of an antiplatelet. And after that, we usually put them on dual antiplatelets for, uh, for three to six months. Okay, and that's and that's very important because if you don't do that, then it's likely that the the stand is going to go down, and you'll have wasted all this money and uh, and energy for uh, for not a good reason. Um, having said all this, uh, now with the introduction of uh, of DOACs, um, all these guidelines are likely to change. So for people who are um, um, we see more and more people put on uh, on DOACs. Uh, and these are the direct oral anticoagulants, okay? As we see more and more people putting on that. Um, however, if you, there, there, there was a recent uh, uh, survey that was published in Europe, in European centers that showed that actually the anticoagulation protocols are very, very different. So there's a, there's a huge heterogeneity when it comes to how we anticoagulate these people after an, an endovascular procedure. Um, so, so yeah, there, there's not a short answer to this. I mean, in every center, unfortunately, the, the, the protocol the protocol is different, but the general rule is that most people will be put uh, on, um, on a blood thinner. And of course, there, there was this, the Voyager, the Voyager PAD study, that actually showed that um, there might be a benefit in terms of patency uh, in patients who are receiving a, a DOAC uh, on top of aspirin 
uh, after an end of after a revascularization procedure. I would strongly recommend to read that vascular pad uh, study, Voyager. It's called Voyager pad study. Um, because it's one of the biggest studies on this uh, on this area of anticoagulation, and I think in the future there's going to be I'm sure there's going to be developments because there has been, you know, a massive there has been a lot of progress when it comes to all these new devices and balloons and atherectomy devices and all these new stuff, but when it comes to okay, what do we do to make sure that, you know, the result of the revascularization stays patent for longer using medical therapy, this hasn't changed much the last uh, 20 years and our protocols are pretty um, pretty old. So there's gonna be, there's gonna be, there should be change on that. Any other questions? Yeah, no, okay. Thank you very much, Gregory, for that very amazing presentation. So, and thank you everyone else who joined in today. See you again, same time next Thursday. Have a good day, everyone.